Hey, everyone. Oh, cool. You can hear me. Great. Um, so um, welcome to Documenting Attacks on the Press in the Age of Trump. Um, my name is Camille Fassett, and I'm a reporter at Freedom of the Press Foundation. And I'm Alex Ellerbeck. I run the North America program at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, the project we're going to be talking about today is called the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. Um, and um, this was a project that was started um, just last year in 2017. Um, and just uh, essentially the goal is to, um, as systematically and comprehensively as possible, um, track and document all attacks on the press um, in the United States. Um, and obviously there's, there's been robust press freedom documentation um, in the United States before, um, but there, it really wasn't centralized. There was no sort of comprehensive and connected effort through any sort of co um, coalition um, and through which this data was easily accessible. Um, and there, it was no one's full-time job. So essentially this project um, was, was to change that. We weren't really able to answer questions like um, how many journalists were arrested in 2016. Um, or how many leak investigations were open in 2015. Um, we don't really have comprehensive numbers to answer either of those questions, um, but we're hoping with the help of the tracker that we'll be able to answer those questions moving forward. Um, this is what the, the US Press Freedom Tracker looks like, um, and you can visit it at https pressfreedomtracker.us. Um, the US Press Freedom Tracker is made possible by a coalition of about 30 different partnering groups. Um, Freedom of the Press Foundation is the, the managing organization, so essentially my job as a reporter is I, I run a lot of the day-to-day -day operations with an, um, a couple of my colleagues at Freedom of the Press Foundation, so we do the actual day-to-day -day reporting. So when we hear of a, a press freedom incident, um, whether through Twitter or sometimes a journalist reaches out to us, um, we'll follow up on tips that we receive and sort of report that case out, sometimes relying on reports that are, have already been uh, made available by other uh, news organizations. So you can see our, the 30 different organizations here. Um, and, um, and Alex um, heads the steering committee, which is made up of a couple different um, partner organizations, which includes um, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, the Index on Censorship, um, and Reporters Without Borders, as well as um, the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Um, and here's just some of the numbers. So th these numbers are from um, starting with January 1st, 2017. So since we started counting, um, we've documented 177 press freedom violations, not counting a few that are still in the backlog, which we'll get to next week, hopefully. Um, so just to highlight a few things here, um, there's four federal leak prosecutions that we've started counting. Um, so that's all under the Trump administration, of course. Um, we've counted 37 reporters arrested. Um, 20 different denial of access cases. And one number that's particularly striking to me is um, that 64 um, of these cases occurred while reporters were covering protests. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the specific dynamics of, of journalists covering, covering protests later in the presentation. But um, to me, these numbers are, I found surprisingly high um, and pretty striking. So I think that these, um, these numbers are, are showing that journalists are facing a variety of threats doing their jobs um, in, the, in the Trump age um, as well as before. So we have a few different um, types of categories of incidents that we count, and you can see some of them here. For example, denials of access, um, equipment, seizure, equipment searches and seizures, as well as physical attacks. Um, another, some, some categories are sort of um, easier to, to, to count than others. For example, uh, leak prosecutions. It's pretty clear what counts as a leak prosecution, um, and, and, and it's a little more complicated when it gets to things like chilling statements. Um, so when we started this project, we knew we'd be looking at leak prosecutions, protests, um, arrests, uh, electronic device searches at the border. We didn't think that we would be looking at murders. Um, but on June 29th of this year, a gunman entered the offices of the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland, and killed five people. Four journalists, Gerald Fishman, Rob Hyacin, John McNamara, and Wendy Winters, and a sales assistant, uh, Rebecca Smith, who worked for the publication. He had previously tried unsuccessfully to sue the newspaper for defamation. And this wasn't even uh, the first murder of a journalist this year. Um, in just a month earlier, uh, independent music journalist Zachary Stoner was killed in Chicago. Uh, he published on a YouTube channel, Zach TV One, um, and he covered mostly he, he covered Chicago's South Side, um, 
mostly covering hip hop and drill music. Uh, he interviewed rappers and gang members on his, his channel, and many people believe uh, that his killing might be connected to his work. Uh, if this is the case, uh, Zach's killing would represent uh, the first murder of a journalist in retaliation for their work in the United States uh, since Chauncey Bailey was murdered in Oakland in 2007. Um, and the fact that his murder was then followed um, by uh, the killing of uh, five other people in a newsroom makes this year particularly tragic. Um, the Committee to Protect Journalists is a global press freedom organization. We work around the world. Um, we track journalists imprisoned and journalists killed. Uh, 33 journalists have been killed in direct reprisal for their work this year. Um, we're investigating 13 other killings to determine the motive. Um, but with the, the murders in the U.S. this year, um, the United States is the third deadliest country uh, following behind Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, this is not the norm uh, in the United States. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the last uh, murder of a journalist in direct reprisal for their work uh, that we'd seen in the U.S. was in 2007. Um, and in 1994, we actually reported on eight unsolved murders of Vietnamese language and Spanish language journalists in the 1980s and 1990s. So obviously the numbers that we have um, are pretty striking and, and, and pretty horrifying, at least to me personally. Um, but I think it's also important not to jump to uh, conclusions about what this data means and what it doesn't mean. Um, so we've only started counting January 1st of 2017. So I think that obviously with, with, with Trump and uh, with Trump, the Trump presidency, I think that a lot of people are, are more concerned about press freedom than they used to be. Um, and I think one of the more common questions we get is whether or not um, press freedom violations are becoming more prevalent, whether that they've gone up in the Trump administration. And the honest answer is we, we, we can't answer that question. We just haven't, we just don't have the data. We haven't been counting long enough. Um, it's also important not to necessarily attribute any specific incident to Trump's rhetoric. And that's not to say that the rhetoric doesn't matter. It's, it very much does, and it's created a, a pretty hostile press freedom climate in the United States. Um, but it's just important on an individual level to be careful about what we can claim and what we can't claim from this data. Um, also, the categories are really different in how comprehensive we can claim that our data is. So with things, we, with things like leak prosecutions, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I think it's pretty clear. And we, we, try to, we think that we're pretty accurate in terms of arrests um, and, and physical attacks. But with things like subpoenas, it's a lot more complicated. Um, for example, um, sorry, one second. Um, I think that it's just like we just there's a lot more there's a lot of things that we we can't count for example online harassment of journalists um, obviously that's a huge huge problem but it's really really it's pretty difficult to track that in any sort of comprehensive way so we've counted since January 1st 2017 uh, 36 reporters who've been arrested uh, most of these have been short-term OS um, most of the journalists have been held for less than 24 hours and charged with misdemeanors, although I don't want to downplay the impact that that can have. Um, even being charged with a misdemeanor can screw up your job. It can be incredibly uh, financially burdensome uh, for journalists who were uh, charged in the context of Standing Rock, North Dakota. They found that they had to keep returning to North Dakota for hearings, um, which was incredibly uh, time consuming and expensive. Um, but there were two cases uh, that were even more striking, and those were the two journalists charged with felonies uh, at the J-20 inauguration protests. Uh, fortunately, uh, both of them have been cleared of charges. And then there is one case that is still uh, particularly egregious and ongoing. Uh, a journalist, Manuel Duran, um, was arrested while covering an immigration protest in Tennessee. Um, he was not doing anything illegal, but he was caught up um, along with a number of protesters. Um, and then because of his immigration status subsequent to his arrest, even though charges were dropped, he was placed in ICE detention and he is currently still in ICE detention.
I, I want to talk a little bit about the dynamic uh, at protests. Um, of the arrests that I mentioned, 31 of those occurred at, um, at protests. 64 of the cases uh, on the press freedom tracker occurred in the context of protests, um, the majority of these being arrests, equipment seizures, or physical attacks. And journalists are facing a, a difficult dynamic. On one hand, uh, journalists used to be very valuable to protesters themselves as a way to get the message out. Um, but now, as protesters um, have access to social media, uh, live streaming, and uh, you know their own ways to, to communicate directly with the public, um, journalists are often seen with more suspicion. There's more concern that they may misrepresent uh, the protest, and uh, in some cases, we've seen increased concern about doxing as well. Um, so some of the physical attacks that we documented came in the context of Antifa protests, um, where uh, individuals were very concerned about journalists, especially photojournalists, uh, capturing images uh, that could reveal their, their identity. Um, at the same time that we see uh, journalists uh, sometimes face more distrust or hostility from protesters, um, we also see significantly more aggressive tactics from law enforcement. Um, and the one in particular that has led to uh, a huge number of cases on the press freedom tracker is kettling. That's when police surround a group of protesters, civilians, journalists, um, legal observers, everybody in a given area, uh, and essentially arrest or give citations to, to everyone in that area, uh, often detaining them for a significant period of time. Uh, this tactic was used in Standing Rock, um, in uh, inauguration uh, in Washington, D.C. during the inauguration protests, and in a series of protests in St. Louis in September and October of last year. Um, as I mentioned before, I think subpoenas are one of the more complicated categories that we track. Um, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press did a survey sort of attempting to try to uh, determine just how many media attorneys and news organizations receive um, sort of subpoenas um, every year. And this was a while ago. This was in 2001. And they um, found res responsive to their survey that um, 823 subpoenas were issued that year. Um, and if that's extrapolated to the 2,300 or so media organizations nationwide, that comes out to um, almost 6,000 subpoenas, which is an average of 2.6 per news organization. Um, which is like pretty wild, and that could be more or less since that's um, obviously, that was obviously a while ago. Um, and in terms of the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, we've documented 20 since we started counting. So obviously, we're not capturing them all. Um, but we hope to highlight at least some of the more significant ones. And just to sort of touch on some of the ones that you see in front of you, um, there's been sort of a, they can look like a, a variety of different things. Um, sometimes subpoenas can look like um, a subpoena for a news organization um, to produce documents. And sometimes, for, for the Chicago Tribune case that, that you see above you, um, three different Chicago-based newspapers were subpoenaed to produce um, copies of news articles that were already publicly available. So that's obviously pa uh, placing the burden of work on a news organization when obviously the prosecution is perfectly capable of getting that information themselves. Um, other times, it's a subpoena for a journalist to reveal the, the identity of a source. Um, and um, so those are just a few of the different types of threats that we see. Um, sometimes it's to testify um, in, the, in, a, in a trial of a source um, as to maybe an unpublished or um, sensitive conversation that a journalist had. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of an important point is that these subpoenas make journalists' jobs really, really difficult, especially for smaller, less well-researched news organizations. For example, if a journalist is um, ordered to testify in the trial of a source, that journalist can't cover that trial anymore because that becomes a conflict of interest. Um, so really, it's unfortunate that these subpoenas and legal orders are not only um, placing the burden on the attorneys of the news organizations, but the, the journalists themselves. So another area where we've done uh, a lot of work is in regards to 
uh, stops at the border, and particularly in regards to uh, searches of electronic devices, cell phones, and laptops. Um, right now, U.S. Customs and Border Protection claims that they have the authority to search electronic devices at the border without probable cause. The ACLU and EFF are currently challenging whether that is actually constitutional in court. Um, but in the meantime, it's still a very real threat to anyone um, crossing into the United States. Um, while we don't have specific comparison data on the number of journalists stopped at the border, um, we know that electronic device searches in general have increased under the current administration. And these stops and searches are incredibly troubling for journalists. Um, and they affect both U.S. citizens and non-citizens. Um, and for journalists, it, there is nothing more core to the profession than the ability to protect uh, your sources and sensitive information that they give you. Um, so the idea of being asked by a government agent to hand over your laptop um, or your phone and let them rifle through it is incredibly jarring, dangerous, and traumatic. Um, so we're aware of a number of these cases. Not all of them have fit in the time frame of the tracker, um, but we've captured at least five cases of, of sort of invasive border stops overall. At least two of those have involved um, searches of electronic devices. We have another case of a journalist who was denied entry completely. Um, and beyond that, we know of cases like Laura Poitras, who was stopped uh, dozens of times at the U.S. border. I think one of the one of the big questions that always comes up when talking about what is the state of press freedom in the U.S. right now, uh, it always comes back to Trump and Trump's rhetoric about the media. And he has a lot to say about the media. Um, in fact, um, we had a research assistant at the Committee to Protect Journalists who started as a side project logging all of his tweets about negative tweets about the media. Um, and uh, by the end of last year, he was already at uh, a thousand since when he began his uh, presidential campaign. So uh, the volume is impressive. Uh, we can't and don't attempt to count all of that on the press freedom tracker. Um, we do count some of the most egregious examples as chilling statements, especially when they involve legal threats um, <clears throat> or threats to use the regulatory power of the government against certain uh, media outlets. But it's, you know, there is a, a sense to which some of this is just a distraction. And uh, journalists are tough. They can take an insult. Um, and you can overstate how big of a deal it is if Trump says some nasty things about the press. I mean, the press and the government have always had an oppositional relationship. Um, but the rhetoric also, it, it does matter. Um, it matters when Trump tweets about an individual journalist. Uh, he tweeted about Megyn Kelly dozens of times, and every time after he tweeted about her, you would see a spike <clears throat> of harassment and rape threats that she would receive. Um, but probably most important to us as an international organization, uh, CPJ, is the effect it has abroad. Um, we saw that in 2017, twice as many journalists were arrested on charges of fake news as 2016. And this has a direct link, we believe, with the increase in the use of fake news by one of the uh, world leaders with the biggest platform um, uh, across the globe. One of the big questions, uh, so aside from the global impact, is whether this rhetoric would translate into legal threats in the United States. And to look at the way 
that hostility to the press can potentially translate into legal threats, uh, one person in particular is very important, and that's Attorney General Jeff Sessions. During his confirmation hearing, Sessions refused to make a commitment that he would not put journalists in jail for doing their jobs. Since that time, he has repeatedly vowed to go after leakers, has floated the possibility of revising the Justice Department's guidelines for subpoenaing reporters to make it easier to do so, and has overseen four leak prosecutions. Um, so I think when we talk about leak prosecutions um, under the Trump administration, um, I think most people are probably aware of the reality winner case. I think that's probably the one that most people are aware of. Um, I, I know that when I first saw those numbers, just even when I was putting together this presentation, it took me a minute to try to remember all four. I don't, I'm not sure that most people could name all four. Um, so in addition to, re to reality winner, um, James Wolfe um, was accused of um, lying to the FBI, um, and um, Terry Elbury, um, is another one, and Joshua Adam Schultz is the fourth. So there's been four total under the Trump administration. Um, not all four of those um, prosecutions are Espionage Act. Um, not all of the not all of those alleged sources um, are are charges under the Espionage Act, um, but three out of the four are. Um, so the Espionage Act is about a hundred years old, and it was originally um, established to to um, prosecute foreign spies, but since its inception, it's been used um, in a myriad of other ways. Um, even at the time that it was it was going through Congress, um, policymakers were concerned that it was vague and overly broad and could be used to target a wide range of people, and we've seen that to be true. The first people um, charged under the Espionage Act were actually anti-war activists um, during, World, during World War I, and um, socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs was charged under the Espionage Act and the Supreme Court has upheld a number of convictions of these anti-war protesters um, under the Espionage Act, and that was in um, 1919. It wasn't until 1971 that someone was charged with leaking information to the media, and that was Daniel Ellsberg. Um, he obviously released the Pentagon Papers um, and revealed that the government had repeatedly lied to the American people about the truth about the Vietnam War. Um, and just to touch on briefly what makes espionage charges um, so outrageous is that they are incredibly difficult to fight because they don't allow for a public interest defense. Um, and we'll touch on the reality winner situation a little bit more later on, but essentially a variety of circumstances make it incredibly difficult to fight, um, and it really makes it difficult for defense attorneys to even be able to, just due to the nature of secrecy surrounding it, really able to um, put up a strong defense. So I think that when having conversations about leak investigations um, and Trump's crackdown on the press, it's important to understand how we got to where we are because this didn't start with Trump. Um, Obama has actually, uh, Obama put away in prison um, more journalistic sources than every administration combined. So only three leakers were prosecuted under the Espionage Act before 2009 um, versus eight under Obama. Um, and um, so I think that al although when we look at like Trump's attorney general, who obviously refused to commit um, to not imprisoning um, journalists, we can take a look at um, Obama's attorney, attorney general, Eric Holder, who said, at the, who said um, while he was attorney general that, while I'm attorney general, um, I think the exact quote is, um, no reporter who is doing his job is going to go to jail. This was tested um, once um, in 2011, the, uh, the Obama Department of Justice issued a subpoena for the testimony of New York Times reporter James Risen and ordered him to identify his source. Like any good reporter, um, he refused to name a source and that led to a seven-year court battle that ended up in the Supreme Court. Um, the Obama administration actually won, but the, the DOJ um, eventually relented, potentially because of the optics of sending a reporter to jail after making a public statement like that aren't great. Um, and um, in 2013, federal investigators seized about two months of phone records for reporters and editors of the Associated Press that included um, more than 20 different telephone lines of its offices and journalists um, as part of a government investigation into leaks. Um, and obviously Trump has, has really built on what Obama and the infrastructure that Obama put into place on that front. So even before his inauguration, um, Trump called on Congress to investigate leaks to the press regarding Russia's alleged hacking of um, both Democratic and Republican, Republican national political committees, um, as, well, as well as Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, uh, John Podesta, during the presidential campaign. 
I think that it's definitely true that press freedom looks differently under Trump um, than, it, than, it, than it did under Obama. Um, I think that um, like Trump really targets individual reporters, whereas Obama um, did not do that, and clearly their use of, of things like Twitter is completely different. Um, but I think that if you actually look at, like, so there's four prosecutions um, under Trump, and there were eight under Obama. And it's important to acknowledge that the Trump presidency is um, potentially less than halfway through. Um, so we don't totally know what those numbers will look like. But in terms of the damage that's been caused so far, um, I mean, Obama put away more um, leakers in prison than Trump has. Um, I mean, obviously, Trump's rhetoric has been obscene, um, but I think it's just really important to acknowledge like the history of, of how we got to where we are. And um, I think that like if you look at the reality winner situation, um, like as far her her treatment has really like broken with precedent, and she's going to spend five years in prison for leaking what was a single document. So even even in the context of other espionage prosecutions, um, her treatment has been really really extreme. So I think that's exacerbating what was already taking place um, under the Obama administration. And then um, what was the first incident of, instance of this happening that we know of? Um, in February, the, the uh, Trump Department of Justice notified um, New York Times journalist Ali Watkins that it had seized years of her phone and email records. She was only informed of this after the fact, so there was no way that she could um, challenge that seizure. Um, the records included metadata um, of each call, text message, and email that she sent um, between, I think it was 2014, going back to when she was an undergraduate intern. Um, Obviously, that information is highly sensitive, although it doesn't include the actual content of the messages. So that's the first instance that we know of in which the Trump administration has directly um, gone after a journalist's like, sensitive communications. But um, that's just that we know of. And um, it definitely seems like uh, Trump is really building on what Obama put into place. So obviously, this is a huge problem. Um, this is forcing journalists to go to extraordinary lengths to protect their sources. And these are just some of the digital security tools that journalists um, are sort of forced to use. And um, personally, I think that's bullshit. Um, I think that the, the problem with this is that journalists, um, the stakes of failure are so high. Journalists um, are responsible for protecting their sources and making sure that they don't go to prison. So they're forced to learn how to use really complicated um, and not super user-friendly technologies like PGP encryption. Um, like I know when I was first learning to use PGP, um, I think that I generated four different key pairs and then I deleted the private keys so I couldn't revoke them. So um, yeah, so um, I talked to a journalist once who, when she was learning to use PGP, um, put sensitive information in the subject line. And these things might seem obvious to, te to technologists or people who use PGP on a daily basis. I'm really sorry for you if that's you. Um, but, <laughs> so, but I mean, it's just like, this also takes away a lot of time that journalists um, could be spending on their work, could be spending on investigating, on, on writing, um, on editing, um, and instead they're they're spending time in, in digital security trainings and fighting legal battles in court. Um, and um, yeah, just the stakes of failure are obviously really, really high. And disproportionately, it's the, the, the less resourced journalists who sort of face these burdens. It's the freelancers and the alternative media. Um, and um, this, is how, this is how brave journalism gets chilled, because journalists might be less likely to pursue stories that might um, endanger their sources if they perceive to be higher risk. And sources, um, in turn, might be less likely to come forward because they're not really sure how to protect themselves. And it puts journalists in the position of, of trying to te teach their sources, in some situations, digital security, um, when oftentimes they're just learning it themselves. Um, so a friend of mine, um, Tom Lowenthal, who's an engineer at Brave, um, says that even when journalists win in that they are able to protect their sources, society loses because it's created a culture in which um, it's really putting this burden on journalists. So I guess where does this all leave us? We've, you know, there's unprecedented level of concern about uh, the state of press freedom in the United States. Uh, we know that many of the threats existed before the current administration, uh, but I think there's a sense that uh, they've been, if anything, exacerbated. Uh, and so a bunch of press freedom groups came together and started collecting data, but data in itself doesn't change anything. Um, so what we've been working on um, with the coalition is figuring out how we can use this data uh, to take actions that will help uh, 
reporters who are facing these threats. Um, press freedom groups came together for an investigation into police conduct in St. Louis. Um, and fortunately, the reporters who were arrested in St. Louis have so far not been prosecuted. Um, we've been able to better organize assistance and advocacy for reporters who are facing charges for doing their jobs um, by tracking comprehensively reporters who've been arrested um, or are facing legal demands. We can connect them with legal assistance, usually uh, through our partners at the Reporters Committee more, uh, more quickly and more efficiently. Uh, the data from the Press Freedom Tracker has been cited in the media, in legal briefs, in Congress, um, and it's allowed journalists to understand the scale of the problem. Um, it's allowed them to contextualize it, sometimes realizing that threats are bigger than they thought, otherwise, other times realizing maybe they're not quite as bad. Um, and they can accurately communicate the scale of the problem. And so now I think we wanted to hopefully show you the project itself um, and take you on a demo through the Press Freedom Tracker. Why is that not showing up? Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this is the website itself. One second, but I can't get to that desktop. Um, so essentially, um, these are the categories that we count. So you can; these are the different categories that you can search by. So, for example, if you're interested um, in cases that just involve Trump, you can go ahead and type that in. Um, so, say you're interested in physical attacks that occur between two dates, you can search that way. Um, and you can also even search by journalists that are still actively facing criminal charges. So, there's a variety of different ways that you can, that you can search. Um, you can search by location as well. So, he, just you can take a look at some of the more recent incidents that we've counted. Um, for example, um, the LA Times was just ordered to delete um, information that, that um, was mistakenly made public um, through PACER, which is a, a database of court records. Um, and once that information is made public, it's obviously a huge press freedom threat that they'd be um, ordered to retroactively go back and delete that. So eventually, um, that, that decision was overturned. Um, obviously, we mentioned the case of, of uh, four journalists and a media worker being murdered in Annapolis. Um, and just these are some just some of the more recent cases that we've counted. Um, there's about uh, just under 200 total. And obviously, um, we uh, I've still got a few in the backlog as well. So this is um, one that I found pretty interesting. Um, so. The, um, Jersey City removed over uh, about 240 community newspaper boxes from its streets. Um, they, they said that this was um, a terrorism threat because people might put uh, backpacks in the boxes, I guess, um, was the threat when I reached out for them for an explanation. Um, they didn't really respond to questions about are they intending to remove garbage cans and other things like that. Um, and so we just documented this one pretty recently. Um, and I, there was a pre pretty widespread public backlash about this because it's fairly clearly uh, pretty ridiculous. Um, and so eventually what happened was that um, the city agreed to return the newspaper boxes, so they're now back on the streets. But at the time, um, they said that newspapers who went through a permitting process could um, have their boxes returned on the streets, but there was no permitting plot process in place, and they just intended to do this months in the future. Um, so it was kind of a bizarre case. It doesn't really f clearly fit into any of the categories that we count, but. Um, we just found out um, fairly recently that one of the, the, the reporters that I spoke to um, for this story had been arrested at a protest about this. So we're constantly finding new incidents and we're constantly finding out things that we didn't know happened, um, even as far back as like 2017. So we'll go back and count that. Um, and as always, if you know of an incident that we haven't counted, you can reach us at tips at pressfreedomtracker.us. So anything else you want to add? Great. Um, I guess we'll move on to questions. I don't really know. I guess there's a little microphone there. So if anyone has one, please pop up and ask away. Hey. So listening between the lines of what your talk is, it sounds almost as if I'm, basically I'm going to put words in your mouth and like you're going to defend them, which is incredibly unfair. But um, it sounds like the the overall narrative is that 
the powers that be would very much like there to not really be one agreed upon truth. Um, and if there's a protest where there are no journalists there, or if the journalists are questioned, then the only one um, talking about what's happening are people that have an agenda, and therefore their content or what they're saying is suspect. Is that reasonable to put those words in your mouth, or am I not, am I not getting your overall oomph? I think, uh, so, if I understand correctly, I think that can be, I, I mean, certainly uh, the battle over controlling the narrative uh, can be a dynamic, and it can be a dynamic that's incredibly dangerous for reporters. Um, and we've seen that um, police now also have their own social media accounts and also have their own media outreach and are also trying to control the narrative. and. Um, you can see how uh, they may have hostility towards uh, towards journalists who are coming with with different narratives. Um, but I think there's a number, you know, there are a number of dynamics at place depending on what the threat is. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's just almost a sort of laziness or lack of caring. The Please don't want to distinguish who's a journalist or who's not. They don't want to figure out who's a citizen journalist, so they decide to lump everybody together. We'll charge them all at once, and we'll deal with it later, and we don't care if people get totally screwed over um, by that. Uh, so, you know, I think it, it, it depends, and, you know, a number of the threats come from, some threats come from private actors, some, some threats come from uh, city officials, some come from the federal government, so it, it's a diverse array, um, and journalists sort of have to deal with it all. And just to touch on like the protest aspect, I mean, there are a variety of people who are like filming at any given protest. Some of them might be people who are with um, like institutions, um, like large publications, and other people might be live streamers. Maybe those live streamers um, also are not particularly like neutral on a topic. Um, like some of the, and and so at, at the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, we try really hard to avoid like defining who is and who isn't a journalist because we think that's like a pretty dangerous territory to get into. So essentially, the way that it works is that um, we try to answer the question of whether or not someone was engaged in an act of journalism. Um, so, I mean, so for example, in terms of the attacks at protests, like, it can get pretty complicated because someone's like a live streamer who has, who has a, like a pretty far right wing blog who is then attacked at a protest. And generally, it really just depends. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it really just depends on the situation. Thank you. Uh, what resources would you recommend that we give to journalists that we meet in the field to help educate them on operational security? Like, I've met people in Mexico who've gotten arrested and I've tried to like educate them a little bit, but are there established resources that you would recommend, other stuff like that? Well, um, I, I think it depends a lot on where they're based. So um, my organization, Freedom of the Press Foundation, one of the other things that we do is we teach digital security trainings to journalists. Um, and that includes things in, like how to use di um, different kinds of like digital tools. Um, but that also includes like some operational security training because I think a lot of this just really doesn't come naturally to most people. Um, I think with a crowd like this, um, some things like might seem really, really obvious, but they aren't at all to journalists. Um, so I think that in terms of resources that I would recommend, I think that you should de definitely check out Freedom of the Press Foundation's website. We have a variety of different um, like guides, for example, things like um, choosing a VPN and things like that. Um, there's also lots of guides that a good friend of ours, Martin Shelton, um, call out to him, um, has put together in, in both digital and operational security. Um, I, I, in terms of the international context in Mexico specifically, um, that's, I'll let Alex speak to that part of it. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of organizations that have incredible resources, um, uh, and I think Camille named a ton of them. I think the point that I would most make is that one-off handing somebody a list of resources or doing a one-off training when you're trying to engage change systematic behavior giving people a fancy new tool sometimes it just makes them feel like they're just knowledgeable enough to be more dangerous to themselves um and so uh 
I think really focusing on the sociology of how do you change the behavior of an institution like a newsroom in Mexico or a group of freelance reporters based in Veracruz. And there are ways to do that, um, but it involves um, a lot of time, a lot of hard work, a lot of talk about you know, threat models, including much more mundane threat models uh, than, you know, necessarily the, the government using high tech um, targeted hacking to go after you, although that can also happen. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's uh, incredibly important, but it has to be a commitment for the long haul as well. Um, I have a question. You made a point about how it's, and you've made it again, how sort of completely unfair it is to journalists to put the burden of needing to understand their security models and the security systems that they're using to communicate with their sources. And I was wondering, for the people who are engaged in building the tools that journalists use for that sort of security, do you think it's more important to build more secure tools than what we have now to really cover the, the edge cases of the sources that are going to be targeted the most heavily? Or do you think that it would be more worthwhile to build potentially less secure tools, but tools that are uh, faster for the journalists to be able to use and be able to give to their sources without having to understand as much material about how they actually work. I think that if a tool is like hard to use for a journalist, then it can't really like be considered a super useful digital security tool. So I think that's like fundamentally true. Um, I think that like. I think that the, there are like a variety of tools out there and there's so many out there that it can be like really overwhelming when you're trying to figure out figure out like what to use. Um, I think that obviously prioritizing like usability is really, really important and like working with the, the, the community that you're building a tool for is really, really crucial. Like if you're building a tool for journalists, like I think that um, asking like a lot of journalists that question is really, really important. Um, Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not sure that those are always in conflict. And I mean, the ideal is to have a very, very secure tool. And I also think it matters how you define, I think how things are used in practice has some implications on how secure it is. It, is it a very, very secure tool if nobody can, if everybody's messing up when they use it and uh, exposing themselves to even greater risk? Maybe not. So, you know, hopefully those those things aren't in tension. Um, but I do think that there needs to be uh, a lot of emphasis on how tools are used in practice um, and on usability. And when you develop a tool on follow-up um, and testing with the vulnerable com communities who are going to rely on it. Right, and like just just to briefly like touch on that again, like I totally echoing everything Alex said and just like, yeah, I don't think that they're in conflict at all. Like I think that it, like um, it's hard to measure like how secure something is, right? Like and it just depends on the situation, like secure for whom, secure when. Um, like Signal is very, very easy to use. Um, it's just downloading an app. Um, just go ahead and press send with your message, right? But then there's tools like Secure Drop that are a lot, um, they require a lot more training for journalists to use. But I wouldn't say that like one is necessarily more secure than the other. It just really depends on like the context, if that the, makes sense. The specific example I was thinking of when I came up for this question was in the earlier talk about Secure Drop from uh, the EFF team, there was a mention, there was a thing about how they're moving to Cubes OS from in, from a system where you have two machines running tails and one not connected to the internet. And there was a lot of concern in the questions from the audience that that was going to be a significant drop in security, even though the whole point of the operation was to make it so more people would be using the tool. So that's... Yeah, I think that if it was going to be a secured, or if it was going, to, if there's going to be a significant drop in security, I think that that would be a failure on our part. Um, I, I think that that is not something that we would, that, so Freedom of the Press Foundation developed secure drops. So when I say we, I mean Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, I don't think that we would, um, so security is obviously of like that's the, that's the priority for secure drop, and so I don't think that like it's ever okay to compromise like the strength of your like 
security um, for usability. And I don't think that that's what's happening. First of all, great information, worthwhile thing to disseminate. Thank you for doing so. Um, we talk a lot about, OK, how do we make tools better for journalists? How do we get journalists information about security stuff? OK, yeah, that's all well and good. Speaking as a developer of security tools, flipping that on its head, how do I get information about journalist workflows and better understand what they actually need? Do you have any places you might be? Because what I need, what my use cases, my workflows um, are vastly different from someone who's not sitting there hacking on the tools themselves all day. Do you have any resources you would point someone who's looking to learn more about that at, other than like go become a journalist? Because so I would say that the Press Freedom Tracker has thirty partners, and if you go on the website, you can see a list of all of those partners, and most of those are journalist associations, press freedom organizations, um, and some news media organizations, uh, and all of them are dedicated to better safety for journalists. Um, and so that can be a really good uh, entry point, is reaching out to journalist associations and press freedom uh, organizations and using that as a, as a way to get connected to journalists and newsrooms. Yeah, I also think that there's a lot of um, tools that are actively in development, um, like for example, SecureDrop, as well as um, you know things like Sunder and Haven, of course, as well, where Journalists are already working with developers, and I think that that, com that communication regarding like workflow and what is most useful is already happening. So it might be. I mean, I think that those spaces are always looking for contributors. So I think that if you're willing, if you are willing to like donate your technical um, time, I think that that oftentimes is a great way to like learn about what work is actually necessary and like what sort of things are being prioritized, and that might be useful to bring to other projects as well. Cool. It doesn't look like any more questions. So um, yeah, thanks you all. Thank you everyone for coming.